Okay, you're live. Awesome. Hey guys, thanks so much for um, tuning in. Um, we are just about to get started with Bernie Holland. The title of his session is Teaching Less and Learning More, Effective Planning for Assessment and Evaluation. I'm sorry for the late start. Bernie, let's get started right away. Okay, so, so thanks. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, my name is Bernie Holland and as I strongly explained to Sarah, um, I'd, never, I'd never share a session with Andy anymore because you don't get a word in. Um, I've done it uh, a few times already. Okay, so do you want me to go to the screen share? Yes, that would be great. Okay, you got it? Yes. There okay. we go. Fantastic. Okay, thanks. Um, Yeah, just put it in presentation mode. Good. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, like I said, um, this session is actually, I've, in the 10 minutes we're off screen, it's sort of like a bit of a wet weather lesson. I've just gone through and, and deleted half my session, but that's good. Um, there's a couple of main points uh, I do want to get to around uh, teaching less and learning more, and I'll probably be a little bit more f formal, obviously, than... Um, that Andy and Sarah were, were in the previous session, but I also want to, to leave with a couple of key messages. And one of those key messages is that as a teacher, you really need to, to make some serious decisions about your outcome and about how to, how to use your time effectively. Just, just by way of background, I've got two maps up there, probably because I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in each. And, and obviously, Sarah, you're going to jump in with questions as they, as they come up. Um, if you look at the, uh, the map there of South Australia, um, that's where I was raised after moving over from England. I was raised there, um, did my undergrad, undergraduate there as a, as a PE teacher, and then, and this is probably before some of you were born, this will really age me. Um, in 1979, I moved to the state of Washington, did my master's degree in special education, taught there, I found out later, as the, uh, as the second adapted PE teacher uh, in the state of Washington and worked down out of the Vancouver, Washington area. Is this coming through okay, Sarah, or am I talking too fast as an Australian? I can't hear you. You are coming in loud and clear. Okay, fan I can hear you then. Okay, from Washington, I, I went across to the Midwest and did my PhD at, at Michigan State under a couple of really good people. Um, if you check out the names of Ern Seafelt, you'll find the founder of one of the founders of Growth and Development and Janet Wessel um, in Adaptive Physical Activity. She was one of the, uh, the pioneers in that space. From Michigan, I travelled uh, south to Arizona uh, where I taught for th after my PhD. I taught half-time uh, in Phoenix um, as an adapted PE teacher and worked half-time out of Arizona State University. Um, and too hot down there. Three years later, I went up to Wisconsin, and uh, I th think I mentioned to someone earlier this year had a had a mutual friend I worked with there in Scott Fraser um, at University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. Uh, from there, I told my wife we were going on a holiday to America because she was an Iowa girl, and we've been here since 1992. And I've been involved in I was involved in for 20 years in. Uh, in teacher preparation here and then finally escaped from, from university and have, now I manage a professional teaching learning association similar to what you, the old AFID or SHAPE or the state, state level bodies. I remember I was sitting on, I used to sit on the Wisconsin Association of Health and PE Board back in the, in the late 80s. Um, and even back then I used to question some of the things that, that, that we were doing in our curriculum space. Things I want to look at today. I want you, there's a couple of quick key questions. Um, I want you to think about, are you really clear on what you want your kids to leave your program with? Do you plan within your limitations? For example, Andy shared with you that um, here in Australia and in Victoria, in primary school, it's pretty typical for primary school kids to only have uh, 60 minutes um, a week of phys ed. Um, and Sarah alluded to having uh, 67 outcomes, 65 outcomes to address for each grade level. My guess is even if you're teaching PE five times a week, and unless those outcomes are really quite small, 
um, you're going to struggle to teach them all. Um, and then that we need to really clearly delineate our program outcomes. First thing I'd, I'd really encourage you to think about, and this is something whenever I teach uh, curriculum workshops, and I've had the pleasure of, of running those all over the states when I used to live there. I used to work with uh, adapted PD teachers. I've run workshops in, in Guam, Japan, Singapore, and all around Australia. The first thing I ask teachers to do is, can you define your program in 25 words or less? And we don't necessarily have that much time to interact at the moment, um, but um, I'd be really keen for you to to uh, to focus on on defining that, so that um, so that you can be really clear in what it is that you're wanting uh, wanting to achieve. So I've I've actually put one. I think it's 21 words. I don't know how this sits with you guys. Each student has the right uh, to develop the skills and behaviours needed for lifelong physical activity in a healthy and safe environment. And, and I'll go back to a couple of the examples that um, Sarah and Andy were talking about when they were talking about striking skills, when they mentioned about baseball and obviously the more advanced game of cricket. Um, the, I, do, I don't apologise for that, no, I sort of do. Um, but the core elements to those are throwing and catching and striking. And I'm going to use an example later in my presentation that would suggest that regardless of what country you live in, I can't think of a skill that's more important for kids to learn than catching. And so if you, if Sarah has to teach 65 outcomes, I suggest one of those that should be taught really well at the early primary years or early elementary school uh, would be the skill of catching. And that, that um, is a pretty, pretty straightforward decision. And I'll use a couple more examples. Uh, later on to have you think around that. Um, the next thing I have uh, try to get teachers to think about is can you clearly define your outcomes? And as, as Sarah and Andy were sharing before, can they show that those outcomes are measured? And are they willing to hold their programs and PE teachers accountable for effective teaching? Uh, Sarah mentioned that um, in her staff of four that she's the only one that uses rubrics. Um, I, hope, I hope that Sarah is challenging her peers as to why the others aren't, or if they're not using rubrics, are they using a measurement which does demonstrate the effectiveness of their teaching? Uh, this coming Thursday, I'm going in to speak to a group of 13 high school teachers, and one of the things I'm going to be talking to them about is how do they use their time, uh, because in talking to the head of department, uh, they have four teachers on, uh, four lessons on most, most time periods, and a number of them start the lesson by getting together and having one giant game of about 100 kids playing a game. And as far as I'm concerned, all they're doing is just filling time or filling space rather than actually taking their kids off to their own lessons um, and working on some more specific outcomes that those kids might, might need. Um, and also within that, once we start making decisions, and this is something which I've actually been preaching since the 1980s when I was working with Janet Wessel at, at Michigan State, is do we just introduce kids to things or do we make a decision that what we're teaching is actually really important for them to learn? And I might teach less, but in teaching less, I'd actually end up teaching more because I can, I can recall in, in Arizona uh, working with children with uh, intellectual disability in the Mesa public schools, and I would teach even back then every one of those kids with an intellectual disability, I was teaching them how to throw and catch so that they then had a base of skills or a base of ball skills upon which to uh, upon which to build. And I was asked why I wasn't teaching other things and my question would be the same as it is today. Relative to the learners and the, the, the skill level or the speed with which some of those children were learning, these skills were more important uh, for those kids to learn than other skills. And I think that's a critical, if nothing, if you don't get anything from from today by this one point, um, are you teaching an awareness or are you teaching for mastery? Um, and I'm, these are things which I'm not going to spend much time on because I want to get to the main bit, but, but these are just some of the background questions that you would that you would need to make, make sure you're addressing and I'm sure that all of you in your teacher prep and in and other professional learning then have seen these sorts of questions. But 
probably the, the third point down, does everyone teaching into your HPE contribute towards your outcomes? Um, so I'm not going to, to go through each of those individually. This is just sort of pay, painting the picture. Um, but one of the questions, and in, the reason I use year six or year 10 here is in Victoria, um, our primary school finishes at year six and our compulsory physical education finishes at year 10. Year 11 and 12, uh, PE is an elective subject and more of a theory-based subject. And I'm aware that in different school systems in the state, some of your school, you know, some of the schools go from uh, kindergarten to grade four, then grades, grade five to grade eight. But what I would be asking is, at the end of the time for which you're responsible for the group of kids you've got, um, <clears throat> what are the essential knowledge and skills and behaviours you want your students to leave with? And by way of example, I used to ask my um, first year PE teachers, how many of them uh, at, the end of, at the end of grade 10, which was their compulsory um, HPE time, how many of them had the knowledge, skills and behaviours to be able to set up a active lifestyle. They understood why they needed to be active um, and, and had a range of skills and behaviours to be active. And many of them indicated that they didn't. And so I, won't, I can't get up and walk around now because I'm attached to this, but what I used to do is I'd get up in front of the class and I would walk from side to side in the lecture theatre and just say, you know, um, if all you got your kids to do by the end of year 10 was that they had to do what I'm doing, walking vigorously, most days of the week for a certain period of time, you're actually being more successful than many current PE teachers. And to me, that's a critical question to answer. And then I would add that all the other stuff, the stuff that Sarah and Andy were talking about, the throwing, the catching, the running, the jumping, the, the dance, the rhythm, the skateboarding, all of those things are just other options to walking, but the, the core knowledge of I know why I must be active every day is actually the foundation. And so I would challenge you that um, you should be looking at the end of your, your time with your kids, be it grade four, grade six, grade 10, um, and what are those essential knowledges? Knowledge, um, knowledge is, is, a, is a new Australian word. Um, other people just say knowledge, but what are the essential knowledge, skills and behaviours that you want your kids to, to leave your program with? Next thing I ask people to do, and again, I would suggest to you, can you write down the three or four core outcomes that you would have? And I know in, in America you've got your, you've got your standards-based outcomes, but how do you interpret that for your program? I remember um, discussing back in... Uh, 1979, 1980, when I was sitting on the WARF, uh, the Wisconsin Association Board, they had one of the goals back then, and I'm not sure if it's still the same now, is that, is that all the kids would um, demonstrate a good level of physical fitness and as a result of physical education. And even back then I used to ask the question, but do they know, know why they're being physically, why, um, why we're asking them to, to be physically fit? Um, and my question, my comment back then, and I think it still pertains to some teachers today, is if all we do is get them fit, is that a good outcome? Or do we give the, the knowledge behind that? Because um, to get them fit would actually require all of my physical education time. And I wouldn't be able to then focus on, uh, on other, other things necessarily. But so I'd really encourage you to think, what are your core outcomes? And then does every one of your program, every one of the things you do, link back to your core outcomes? Um, because if they're not, I'd suggest you rethink why they're doing them. And I think uh, you know, Andy and Sarah commented on, you know, people go to a workshop, they pick up a new game and they use it on Monday. And I used to call that the hope model, but I still do, where you find an activity and just hope it works rather than it being something which is really core to to your program. In in uh, Victoria, and again, I'm not. These are all tools uh, that you that you probably have access to. But one of the things in terms, and I'm I'm drilling down, going to be drilling down into just some a couple of really basic questions in a minute. Um, but 
But I always encourage, are we looking at the program level, the year level, and the unit level? So do you have a really good uh, handle on some of the types of things uh, that you need to address? And this link is just one that if you wanted to look at uh, for the Victorian Curriculum and Assessment Authority, which drives uh, curriculum uh, here in Victoria. But some of we just, and again, these, these are just core questions which you can go back to, but there's a range of questions that you would ask about your HPE program. Sarah, I think, has already mentioned that her four teachers, you sound like you might be on different pages at different times. So do you have um, an overarching scope and sequence that all of your kids um, address? I know this school I'm going to on Thursday has one in paper but not in, not in action. And then we look at some of our year levels, some of the major types of things we look at, and then obviously on, on a week-to-week -week basis. And as, as Andy referred to, um, he teaches his kids once a week. So um, he has to be fairly clear in his learning intentions, the t new terminology today, or in some of his content outcomes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I just uh, also want us to think about a um, couple of things related to, and again, I'm just stating the obvious. I'm going to get to one, the, um, the third point down here and really make a focus on it. But you know all of these things impact your setting, and all of you plan around those, um, around those impacts. But for my so, – so you can go through that list um, as you wish, and I'm sure each of you can, can see those as challenges or constraints. But one of the things which I think we don't – look at um, sufficiently. I know we don't here in Victoria um, and I'm not sure we do elsewhere is that we don't actually look at how much time we have to teach and then how much time it takes uh, to learn a movement. So um, I'd ask you to be thinking how much time do you actually have? So Andy tells me you know, he has 60 minutes a week um, and in 60 minutes a week what can be achieved, particularly if I know that if, and Andy is an exceptional teacher, but from the um, on-task time stuff, an exceptional teacher might have, might be able to spend 50% of that time working, which means Andy's actually got 30 minutes a week to teach. And so he's got to make a really important decision about how he's going to use that time. And uh, Sarah indicated, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but that you indicated you have 67 outcomes, 65 yeah. outcomes to address. Yes, you're how correct. Much, how much time do you have with your class each week? I see my students every single day for 40 minutes. Okay, so of that 40 minutes, and I'm sure that you're a really good teacher, would they be active for 25, 20, after you take um, your role, waiting, taking turns? Right, they also change their clothes, I would say about 25 minutes. Okay, so 25 minutes, so in 25 minutes a week, um, uh, sorry, 25 minutes a day, um, Sarah's got to teach 65 outcomes. And, no. <laughs> that, and that's what I mean, that we really need to think how much time, and, and we can complain about not having enough time, or we can just, which we always will, or we can just say, let's make use of the time we have and make really, really good decisions. So, you know, have we really thought about how much time it takes for a kid to learn an individual skill? Have we talked about, Sarah, you referred to your game-based concepts. Have we really talked about, uh, thought about how long it takes um, for kids to learn how to move into space? How to move, if you're playing a racket sport, how to move back into the centre court position your dog just woke up behind you. Um, uh, how to develop behaviours such as sharing, respect, taking time, taking turns, etc. Because if we don't actually do that, I think we really get frustrated as teachers um, and we don't see that the impact we, we can be having. Um, so, for example, you know, I might talk to teachers here and they might still typically teach and a four to six week unit, so that means a, and in a primary school that would mean six hours of instruction and some teachers genuinely believe that, you know, weeks one to three they might focus on some of the sports skills 
Weeks four or five, they develop some game-based strategies. In week six, they do some sort of a round robin or a little tournament. And at the end of the lesson, they don't actually, at the end of the week, sorry, the six weeks, they don't actually see what it is that they've um, focused on. And I think one of the problems that I observe when I work with teachers is that actually listed too many things and don't clarify what it is that they're, that they're trying to work on and don't understand developmentally what it is they're trying to work on. I'm not sure, is that, would that Sarah still be um, not your theme-based teaching or outcome-based teaching, but would it still be fairly, uh, not typical, but would you still observe teachers who would introduce a sport and expect to teach it in five or six weeks? Sure, I mean, I think here that in the, Uni in the United States, teachers teach their units at a very accelerated pace. I think the idea of a six-week unit um, sounds very daunting and maybe not feasible here for a lot of people. Um, but one question was asked, if you are given tons of outcomes and you choose the ones that you want to teach in your program, what happens to the ones that you didn't teach? I, I can't say for... Um for you guys, what, what you will and won't be held accountable for. Um, but I would be challenging, I would be challenging, uh, is it realistic for 65 outcomes to be achieved in, what, 40 weeks, 38 weeks? And so I guess what I, I would wonder if this happens, because I know this happens here, are the outcomes being taught? are they being addressed? So for example, I could be teaching uh, the sport of, um, I won't say netball, that's an Australian game, the, the sport of, of basketball, and I could say, yeah, they played a game. And so therefore they moved into space, they took turns, they shared, they defended properly because they were all listed as my outcomes. But I know that in a five-week or a ten-week, unless I explicitly teach kids who do not know how to move into space to move into space, they wouldn't have actually learned it. And so you can say, yep, we've got 65 outcomes, and as a teacher, I've got to decide, you know, which ones am I, and I go back to an earlier slide, which ones am I just creating an awareness on, and which ones am I really having an impact on? Because unless your kids, and no disrespect, are considerably, considerably smarter and genetically learn quicker than Australian kids, um, that just doesn't happen. You know, I've coached a team of kids um, in sports for many, many years, and I know in a whole season of sport, kids may develop a couple of the concepts well, and yet in a phys ed class, we go back to... Um, just creating awareness um, awareness lessons rather than teaching lessons. So I guess in, if that answers your question, can your kids actually learn all 65? I think that that's a terrific response and is getting people thinking. So go ahead and continue. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next thing I have is, and this sort of answers that question to a degree, I'll, and I'll just use content which I think is fairly common to... Uh, to US and to English and to any, any really, most any country, um, I ask my teachers here, are all fundamental movement skills created equal? As in, if I've got 65 outcomes, are they all equally important? And when I ask them this question um, around uh, the, these motor skills, I said, if you can only teach three of those, which could you teach? And if I go back to my earlier definition of, you know, of wanting kids to have active, healthy lifestyles, the three I would teach there would be the throw, catch, and sidearm strike. And my rationale for that is, as adults, how many activities, or even as adolescents and then into adulthood, and now at my age, getting into my late 50s, I never thought I'd be doing this at 58, but that's another question. Um, how many activities do we use as adults that involve the kick? 
And unless you're into mixed martial arts, which I wouldn't advocate, um, you've got soccer and a position in football, gridiron, one position, and other than that, there's really not nothing, anything that uses the kick. Yet if I look at the throw, catch, and sidearm strike, we could be chatting together for the next hour, writing down the types of things that kids can do as adults which relate to the throw, catch, and sidearm strike. So when I ask the question, are all those 65 outcomes created equal? No. That would be, that would be my, my observation. And then similarly within game comp, within when I start teaching games, if I'm teaching invasion games or territorial games, I'm not sure what concept you use there, or, but games like um, touch rugby, lacrosse, uh, basketball, soccer, ones where we are invading other people's space, you know, the first offensive, con there's many, of, uh, many offensive concepts, but the first one I would teach is moving into space. And you alluded to earlier, Sarah, in your first example, that you, you may run a session for you know a number of weeks, but you bring in bring in and out different types of games. I do the same. I'll have an invasion game concept, and I might be teaching netball, basketball, um, soccer, AFL, lacrosse, ultimate. In each of those sports, the first concept, offensive spot concept, I would reinforce would be moving into space. And until kids have that concept, you can't move on to the next one. Um, in the offensive space. Similarly, in the defensive space, um, I would teach, you know, blocking space. So, and, and the, the bottom point there, which I think is the challenge, is as phys editors, we want to teach everything. But we actually have to make decisions about what it is we're going to leave out if we want to teach it well. Um, in my training of teachers, um, I was continually having my time cut. I'm not sure if that's happening in America, but our time was being cut, and I had to make decisions there about what do I leave out of my teacher prep program so that I can make best use of the time I have available. Okay, um, I just want to go on. I'm, I'm conscious that uh, we have um, only about eight or nine minutes, so I'm going to jump through a couple of Bernie. things. So, Bernie, you can go over your time. Um because uh, we have people taking care of the next session. So if you need to go past the eight-minute mark, that's totally fine. Okay, thanks, Sarah. You're welcome. <laughs> I, might be a bit, I might be a bit like Andy here, though. You have to just wind me up. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Okay. I, looked at, I looked at comparing different curriculums, and I, I just wanted to, and you, if, you're, if any of you are interested, you can go in and have a look at the Australian Health and P curriculum. We've, we've got it broken into two different strands, more which would be called health, a health strand and more of an activity strand. Um, and if anyone wants to go in and have a look, you can go into that link, um, that link there, and, and have a play around just to see, just to see it. But I want to to jump ahead. Um, I won't bore you with um, too much detail. Andy did input, um, did introduce this concept a little bit. But if I look at the bit there called content descriptors, we have some really quite generic terms um, in our curriculum and I actually going to show you a couple of examples and I think this is applicable to to other teachers about how how can we really clearly define what it is we we learn um, we're wanting the kids to learn and therefore I think help help making help make our teaching um, that little bit uh, more clear and so we have you know these um, these terminologies and the two that are important for our PE teachers here are the one at the bottom there, content descriptors, and then these things called elaborations. And I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, this may not look really clear to you, but if, for example, these are the type of statements that our physical educators have to report against. So Andy here, um, if you look at the sh the substrand, if you go halfway down this sheet, if you can see, read it properly, on the left hand side it says a foundation that foundation teachers um, or kindergarten prep teachers need to teach kids, um, need to demonstrate practice fundamental movement skills and movement uh, sequences um, using different body parts. 
and the next level over perform fundamental movement skills. And Sarah, when when we're talking before about outcomes, this is the outcome our teachers need to address. And while you have 65 specific outcomes, our, ki our teachers have a few, and teachers who aren't really skilled like Andy, they just gloss over them. And so they would just have a tick the box, and yet our kids have performed fundamental movement skills in different movement situations. And the push I'm trying to, to really stress is uh, that tells me nothing. And so what I've observed when I've looked at your national standards, which are quite specific, English national standards, Canadian and ours, is that some of them are quite generic. And this is great when you've got good teachers because it allows for teacher interpretation and allows for local, lo what we would call local autonomy. So, for example, if I'm teaching my, my prep kids or my foundation or grade one kids, you could be teaching your kids how to throw and catch. I can be teaching my kids how to throw and catch. Andy can be teaching his kids how to throw and catch. And we are, we're not teaching the same activities, but we're teaching the same outcome. Um, but what I observe, and I'm going to give a couple of specific examples, what I observe is are we addressing or teaching the standards? And by addressing, I go in and I can link my lesson plan, or you, Sarah, tomorrow can link your lesson plan to four different standards. Could you demonstrate you've actually made an impact on those four standards, or you just link to them? Um, and teachers need to make sure that we're interpreting the standards in a meaningful way um, and that we have knowledge of some of, the diff uh, some of the key discipline. Just to give an example, and if I go back to my Victorian example, and I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure how specific you need to be in, in your uh, situations, but a Victorian teacher here, um, they're asked to perform, their kids to perform fundamental movement skills in different movement situations. In our curriculum, the teachers are then given four or five different types of what they call elaborations. It's the types of things that this would represent. One of them at, at year one and two is that they would perform locomotor movements using different body parts. Again, to me, that's fairly, um, fairly general rather than a teacher could say, okay, rather than saying, you know, we're just going to perform fundamental movement skills in different movement situations, I can say, well, actually, I'm going to teach my kids how to run, and they're going to run with correct format, or I'm going to teach them how to catch and control the ball using their hands only. And as a teacher, this goes back to my fundamental question of time, that, sure, I would love kids to learn all the fundamental movement skills. And I would love to learn them in all the different movement situations. But the reality is, you've got your kids 25 minutes a day. Andy's got his kids one hour a week. Occasionally a teacher will have kids for more than once a week here. But in that time period, how long does it take for me to teach different skills? So I'll make, I'll make the, uh, the judgment that some skills are more important than others, whereas other teachers will just tick the box and say, yep, my kids have performed movement skills. The teacher who's more accountable will actually be clearly defining what it is they're teaching. I move up a level, and here one of our, and you, you indicated, uh, Sarah, that if you could just work on game strategies, that would be all you'd want to do. I agree, particularly if it's Australian rules football. But... Um, <laughs> If we practice and apply movement concepts and strategies, that actually tells me nothing as a teacher, if that's all I assess against. And, and unless you as a teacher, and, you, and Andy referred to learning intents, and you talked about learning outcomes, um, and have you, when you, and, and I'll ask this of the other teachers, you know, when, when you're, for example, teaching, if I look at my bottom example, teaching a racket sport, is the first thing that you teach, and that racket sport could be squash, could be badminton, could be racquetball, could be table tennis, could be tennis, could even be volleyball, but you wouldn't necessarily move to the centre court. But in each of those sports, once you've hit the ball or, or shuttle, is the first thing you're going to do 
in introducing that sport is encourage the participant or the student to move back to centre court position. And the point I'm saying, making with this is we need to be really clear about what concept it is I'm trying to teach. So I'm no longer teaching tennis. I'm no longer teaching racquetball. I'm actually teaching returning to centre court position or I'm teaching moving into space. And I think this really links back with, with what you referred to as your, your outcome uh, based education. And then similarly, we can, we can go on through the rest of the curriculum and look at that. So I've just put up there, I start, this is um, some of Andy's curriculum stuff. And you can see there, if you look at his prep, he teaches throwing and catching in, in prep one, two. And then that could actually be reinforced in a whole bunch of sports, which might be target sports in grade three, four, five, six, might be invasion games or could be striking and fielding games. Um, and by doing that, he, he's actually being really quite clear in what it is he's, he's endeavouring to teach. So I guess the, the key, um, um, and this is just a year, a year nine and ten example, but the, and there's a couple of the other examples, but in terms of interpreting a curriculum outcome, are we really clear in defining our learning intention? And I know you mentioned that at the start a couple of times in yours, Sarah, that you're really clear in determining your intent, attention, learning intention or your student outcome. When we do that, it really then focuses everything we do in terms of our instruction, the feedback we give kids. So if I know that I'm working on moving into space, then all I'm going to be doing is really focusing on feedback and reinforcement about moving into space. It focuses my assessment, which then leads my, uh, to my evaluation. If I'm really clear on my outcomes, clearly I can make those um, um, inherent or understood or explicit to students. It can lead to consistency between teachers. And I know there are schools where they do share this and others, which is probably unfortunately still more typical, Sarah, where You've got, as you indicated, a, a team of four, and it sounds like you're not all, not necessarily all consistent in the way that you assess, and it also then impacts our accountability. But a couple of things which which we need to do, and I think this is a real challenge for us to do this, is what content do we remove? You now, the, the one question that came then, I wish we had time for more, and I maybe do, is, you know, how do I teach my 65? Well. Maybe you can't. Um, do we understand the difference between addressing things and teaching things? And then can you justify what you teach? So that when you're having to define also what you don't teach. Um, and then I know in Australia a major challenge we're having here is the actual discipline-based knowledge of the teacher, the, the, the PE teachers, uh, capacity and understanding of, of their content field and I think as you referred to earlier Sarah, knowing the end before you start. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I don't know if there's any other any other questions around or well, Bernie, it's not quite I'm... as interactive as yours but, but I, sorry, the two things is how much time do you have what is your clear learning intent and outcome? Once you've got that, it will then make it easier for you to assess and you'll actually feel like you're, you're teaching more even though your curriculum may, may be smaller. Yeah, Bernie, I think that this um, presentation is really thought-provoking and I, I really am thrilled and I really appreciate that you're here and that you joined us for this because I think that the way that you explained things was very clear, and I think that the physical education community will really benefit from what you had to say. Um, I don't have any clear questions from the audience, um, but one thing that they, some of the people are discussing amongst themselves is, um, you, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if PE teachers assigned homework where students could practice different challenges outside of school? 
And another point was made, um, are we expecting too much from our students if we teach in a program where our minutes with our students keeps getting cut so that minutes in core subjects can increase? Um, do we sometimes have too high of expectations for what our students can accomplish? Yes, we can set homework, and I know teachers that do. And they can set that as practical homework, or they can set that as theory homework. They can. I know teachers then, um, in theory homework, set their grade three, four, five kids. They might set them just to keep track of what's their activity across the week, so they're developing an understanding of that. The other one I think is a more crucial question. Yes, we do try to teach too much. Some of our research and that we've done over here, and I know stuff's been done in the States, um, we found that you know, it may take up to 540 to 600 minutes for a kid to learn one fundamental movement skill. So you've got your kids for 25 minutes. That's four to five weeks just to learn one skill. That's if they're developmentally ready to learn it. So, um, yeah, I think we do. And I think um, while we can continue to fight and argue for um, for more time, and I believe over the next period of time our, some of our um, medical people will be the best people to get on board to encourage us to encourage the benefits of why we need more physical activity and phys ed. And there's some really exciting stuff being done by some researchers over here around physical activity time and benefits, and we know that. The fact is if you've only got an hour a week, you've only got an hour a week. And we really have to be realistic to clarify what it is we're going to do that in that hour that is really important for the kid right now and is really important for the kid towards the future. And I don't think we stop and actually make ask that really hard question because we want kids to have everything. I think that's terrific. Bernie, are you ready to wrap it up? Yep. I thought I did. I am ready because, um, <laughs> no, I am. I, am. It's, it's, I really appreciate this. As I said to Andy the other day, I never thought at 58 I'd be getting on here and doing this, but, you know, it's good to be, uh, good to continue to be engaged. And we hope that we can build this this community uh, as well because it, it's, um, it's really exciting because my thoughts are around at the moment that what teachers have leaving university um, isn't sufficient, and I actually think the professional learning um, is going to make the difference in teachers, and then those teachers can then make a difference in kids. Yes, but I, I really appreciate it. the opportunity, and I we probably need to continue to connect as well. So thank you everyone who did stay awake at the moment. If I was to show you, I don't know if you can see, or you can't see outside. It's a beautiful. The sun's just come out here in. Uh, in Melbourne, I'm looking out of my office over a river flowing past. So, um, you guys, uh, good work, and uh, we will be in contact. Thank you so much, Bernie. Thanks. Bye.